So hi everyone and uh, thank you for joining us for this SONA webinar series. I am Karin Gemeni and I am one of the coordinator of this initiative. Uh, as you probably know, the Society for Neuroscientists of Africa is a non-profit organization that gathers the neuroscientists of Africa and act as a hub for regional and national neuroscience societies and groups in Africa. So with this uh, webinar initiative, we aim to promote research and teaching in neuroscience by giving the opportunity to students and young researchers to learn from renowned scientists. And today, this afternoon, we are very fortunate to have Professor Yanis Weeks from the University of Oregon as a guest. She's probably not to present to many of you because Professor Yanis uh, is one of those accomplished uh, neuroscientists who has been working for more than two decades now advocates advocating for neuroscience in Africa. So um, her CV is very impressive and I will give just two small points. Uh, she has a non-traditional and highly successful scientific career as a neuroscientist turned a parasite researcher also and global health advocate, especially in Africa. So she's been teaching, uh, teaching and sharing her knowledge for more than 20, uh, 20 years now in uh, eyebrow schools, teaching schools, uh, teaching tools, from Uganda to Kenya, Senegal, Morocco, and so on. And she's a specialist of C. elegans. Uh, she's probably going to tell us more about that in a minute. She has been at the University of Oregon for more than 40 years, and she's now an emeritus professor. She's also uh, the chief of uh, She's, uh, she founded a, a company, Nemametrics, which is uh, a company that does translational uh, neuroscience, if I can say it that way. So a, a great example of how a basic scientist can uh, translate uh, his knowledge into something meaningful for the society. So I don't know if she's going to talk about that, but she's a great speaker. I got the opportunity to to meet her at the last uh, Society for Neuro, uh, Neuroscientists of Africa in Nigeria, and I heard one of her talk and I was highly impressed. So now I'm going to turn the stage to her and we're really looking forward to hear what you've prepared for us this afternoon. Thank you, Professor Yanas. All right, good morning, good afternoon. I want to start by thanking uh, Kareen and uh, Mossab for setting this up and also Sona in general. I'm wearing my, whoops, this side, my Sona shirt for this event. Um, right, so what I'd like to do today is tell you about some of the research from my lab and also work that's been done in my company. So the title is Applying Neuroscience to Combat Parasitic Diseases. Um, whoops. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to um, do that. OK, here we go. Right, so um, but I just wanted to first start by acknowledging some of my collaborators, because obviously it's a group effort. Uh, Bill Roberts, Kristen Robinson, Sean Lockery, Joe Urban, John Hodden, and Nikki Liachko, who are at a variety of institutions. And also, I need to disclose, um, Kareen mentioned uh, the company Nemometrics, and so some of us participating in this work own equity in Nemometrics, which I need to disclose to you. Okay, here's an outline of what I want to cover in um, my 40 minutes. Uh, today and I need to start my stop. Yeah, start my stopwatch. Okay, I'm, you know, in this audience, I assume most of you are located in Africa or from Africa. I want to start by talking a little about neglected tropical diseases, which likely you're, you're already familiar with. Then I'm going to talk about the need for new drugs, antihelmintic or antiparasitic drugs to, to treat these diseases. 
than development of a new electrophysiological device for drug research using C. elegans, which is a non-parasitic nematode, but nevertheless quite useful. Then I want to talk about how we've implemented this method in parasitic nematodes, progress towards new antelmintics, and then um, end up with some conclusions. OK, the burden of neglected tropical diseases. Here's a list of the major attributes of neglected tropical diseases. And this name, NTDs, is now transitioning, in some cases, to neglected diseases of poverty. Um, so focusing on poverty, it's poor communities that suffer from them, um, not necessarily tropical. At any rate, I'll call them NTDs. So they're most prevalent among poor people. They're endemic in rural areas and in some urban areas of low-income countries. They're ancient. You can find descriptions of some of these diseases in the Bible. They're chronic. They're disabling. And um, growth delays, blindness, disfigurement. They're associated with a high disease burden but low mortality. So we would say high morbidity, low mortality. So one reason it's thought that they're neglected um, is they don't kill people often. So diseases like HIV, infections like HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, those um, very obviously kill people, which of course is a disease burden, but the NTDs just make people chronically sick and unable to reach their potential. So um, again, lots of morbidity, low mortality. They're often stigmatizing and they promote poverty. So they're seen in poor communities um, and they promote poverty, and poverty promotes the presence of these infections. So if you go to the World Health Organization, um, they list what they call the core group of NTDs, and currently there's 20 that they list, um, and I've organized them here by the nature of the pathogen that causes them. So viral infections, dengue, chikungunya, rabies, bacterial infections, there's a number of them, Protozoal, protozoan infections that include sleeping sickness, African human, uh, African uh, trypanosomiasis or sleeping sickness, uh, leishmaniasis. Then there's some fungal infections. A new thing on this list is um, snake bite. So that's uh, a serious problem that's under um, addressed. A new thing also on this list is ectoparasites, so scabies. And then the longest list is parasitic worm infections. So um, these consist of, if you look at par parasitic worms or helminths, there's three categories. There's nematodes, trematodes, and cestodes. And I'm going to focus today on nematode diseases. So uh, guinea worm disease, river blindness, elephantiasis, and then soil transmitted helminths. And I'll say a little bit more um, about those diseases uh, now. So some of you may have seen these uh, diseases in person. Dracunculiasis or guinea worm um, is contracted by drinking contaminated water and uh, leads to worms emerging from people's typically lower appendages, very painful and debilitating. River blindness uh, is a nematode disease transmitted by flies, and the fly larvae migrate under the skin and in different tissues, and when they die, they cause a huge inflammatory response. So here, um, in the eye, it causes um, corneal opacity and blindness. Uh, elephant lymphatic filariasis, this um, is transmitted by mosquitoes. It's marked by lymphedema, accumulation of lymph in the append lower appendages. And then finally, soil transmitted helminths, which I'll be focusing on today. So soil transmitted, they're um, transmitted through fecally contaminated soil, and they live uh, in the intestinal tract. So here are a couple of hookworms shown on the mu intestinal mucosa, and they feed on blood. OK. And Africa is disproportionately burdened by NTDs. This color code here, the darker the color, means the number of NTDs that are endemic in a given country. 
Uh, it's a little small on my screen. I think the highest is seven. And you can see that Sub-Saharan Africa is the largest hotspot of neglected tropical diseases on Earth. So it's a very significant disease burden. And again, as Corinne said, I've been you know, working in Africa for over 20 years. And I started out as just a regular electrophysiologist, neuroscientist, synaptic physiology, circuits. But through my time in Africa, I became aware of these diseases and others, such as malaria, HIV, and that ultimately led to me um, reorienting my research in this direction. All right, we need new drugs to prevent and treat these uh, nematode infections and other helminth infections. So. Here's a summary. There's only a limited number of antihelminthic drugs available, but they have significant shortcomings. Often people are infected with multiple species of parasitic worms, but these drugs typically don't have a broad spectrum of activity. There are contraindications, can require years and years of treatment to clear infections. And the biggest problem really is ever increasing parasite resistance. And this drug failure is currently the worst in animals. Um, but of course, that compromises human health. I've spent a lot of time in Zimbabwe. Here's a picture of um, cattle owned by my host. And of course, we know that in sub-Saharan Africa, animals are important. The health of animals affect the health of humans. And last night, I looked up online um, just I uh, searched for recent papers on drug resistance. So uh, here's just three representative papers. The first is about uh, drug resistance of um, parasitic worm diseases in cattle. And then um, homunculus contortus, that's a, a parasite that uh, infects sheep and goats that's uh, highly resistant to um, available antihelmintics. And then finally, here's one on, um, oh, canine heartworm. Again, this is a little small. I'm having to look carefully. Right, these are my three dogs, which I hope will not start barking while I'm talking to you all. So canine heartworm is a nematode infection of the heart, which is a serious problem for companion animals, and there's a lot of drug resistance. Then if we look at humans, um, lymphatic filariasis, there's a uh, resistance to the drugs being seen. Um, here's an example of a soil transmitted helminth, um, Ascaris, that's starting to show drug resistance in Rwanda. And then finally, uh, schistosomiasis is a trematode disease, not nematode. You may know it as Bilharzia or snail fever. There's uh, resistance increasing in Asia, and that's going to be a problem for Africa as well. So the punchline here is that there's an urgent need for new treatments and we need drugs that are safe, effective, and affordable. So one thing that drew me to this field of antihelminthic drugs is that uh, most of them on the market target ion channels or neurotransmitter receptors. And just a quick review of the synaptic junction. So you'd if this is a neuromuscular synapse, we have the presynaptic terminal, we have the postsynaptic muscle. Um, in uh, nematodes, this is, uh, there are glutamatergic synapses on the muscle, which are inhibitory. So in these synapses, there's glutamate that's released. They bind to the glutamate receptors and cause relaxation of the muscle. There's also excitatory innervation. I won't mention right now. So the drug ivermectin, which is one of the most famous antihelminthic drugs, um, it's an agonist of these chloride channels, and it causes it opens the channels, causes chloride to go in, hyperpolarizes the muscle, the muscles of the worm, and paralyzes it, which leads to its expulsion. Um, I wanted to mention that this gentleman, William Campbell, he received the Nobel Prize with a Japanese colleague for the discovery of avermectin, which is the chemical from which ivermectin is derived. So this is a big, um, uh, good publicity for neglected tropical diseases in 2015. 
this Nobel Prize. And if we go on and look at other um, classes of antiomintic drugs, there are ones that act on nicotinic cholinergic receptors. There are ones that um, activate GABA receptors. And obviously, for these to be effective, they have to target the worm's ion channels and not the humans. And so that's part of the trick. And um, to exploit the differences in the genes and proteins of these ion channels to find the ones that can be um, targeted by the drugs but won't uh, interfere with the host, either human or animal's um, own receptors. So even though a lot of these drugs um, act on ion channels and neurotransmitter receptors, and they remain really attractive drug targets, the problem was that there was no easy way to detect whether drug candidates disrupt electrical signaling. And so as an electrophysiologist, uh, my colleagues and I decided to see if we could help address this problem. So I'm gonna tell you about a device that we developed um, for that purpose. Okay, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about C. elegans, C. norabditis elegans. It's a nematode or roundworm. The adults are about a millimeter long. So um, they're used widely for biomedical research of all different kinds, and they're very genetically tractable. They're cheap, simple to rear, rapid life cycle. And again, there's very powerful genetic tools. We can use CRISPR to excise endogenous genes. We can splice in ectopic genes to study them. And um, over 60% of human, known human disease genes have orthologs and C. elegans. So C. elegans is not a parasite, uh, but nevertheless, it's played an important role. And just to indicate um, the use of C. elegans, if you look, do a search uh, at the US National Library of Medicine, this shows the number of papers per year um, uh, involving C. elegans. So it's really, um, growing and continuing to be a really uh, influential, powerful uh, model for neuroscience research and all other areas of biology, such as or biomedical research, including development. Okay, we took advantage of this organ uh, in C. elegans. So here's a worm. Shown in green here is the pharynx, which is the first part of the intestinal tract. It's a muscular pump. And the worm uses it to ingest its food. So for C. elegans, the food is bacteria because they, they're a soil dwelling nematode. And in this drawing up here, you can see that the pharynx has muscles, neurons, and gland cells within it. So it's myogenic, that is the muscles have a spontaneous contractile rhythm and it's modulated by neural input. So it sort of like runs kind of like the human heart. So, um, and likewise, you can record pharyngeal pumping um, non-invasively the same way you would record an electrocardiogram. So as you know, if you put these external electrodes on someone's chest and record, you see the characteristic waveforms that reflect the muscle and neural activity of the, of the beating heart. Similarly, you can record pharyngeal pumping. So Raisin and Avery in the mid 90s developed this method. So you have a saline bath, you have a pipette, you suck, you chase the worm around the dish and suck, eventually suck its head into this pipette. Then there's an electrode in the bath, an electrode in the pipette, and you record differentially uh, across there to pick up um, the signals that you see here. So each pump, has an upward going spike, an excitatory spike, E spike, and then an R spike. And that those spikes represent the excitation and relaxation of the pharyngeal muscle during one pump. So this is one pump. And there's also other deflections that uh, reflect synaptic activity within the pharynx. So this is great, but it's very low throughput. You, you record from one worm at a time and it's very slow and it's hard to change drug solutions easily to look at their effect on um, pumping. So my colleague, Sean Lockery, shown here, um, and I worked to develop the device that you see here. So Sean uh, holds the, well, actually the university holds the patent for this device. 
and um, you can see it here. So it's a microfluidic uh, device, and I'll explain in a minute how it's made. But basically, there are eight recording channels. So there's a network of channels. You put the worms in here, and then you gently push them forward with a syringe so that there ends up one worm in each recording module. So there's eight recording modules. Each recording module has an electrode. And then, not shown here, we put another electrode in the input port that serves as an electrical reference and also is where we um, perfuse solutions through the chip. So the solutions go through this network, wash over the worms, and then are collected um, in waste reservoirs. So we can record from eight worms um, while testing perfused substances. So this is, I'm not going to go into microfluidics, but I'll just tell you we use soft lithography methods. The top layer of the chip here is called PDMS, or you might have heard it called Silgard. It's a silicon elastomer that's gas permeable. So while the worms are in there, they're still getting aerated. And then we plasma bond that to just a glass slide on the bottom. So it's a two layer chip, PDMS and um, glass. And then these little channels are at the interface between um, the glass and the PDMS. So as I said, we record from eight worms for hours. And then we also, my collaborator Bill Roberts has developed software and algorithms to automatically detect spikes um, from these recordings and quantify various parameters of the EPG activity. So here's just an example. Here's a worm in a, a C. elegans in a recording module. Um, the channel narrows down to what we call a worm trap. So the perfusate uh, gently holds the worm in position here, and we record the voltages across this um, high resistance location here where the worm is wedged in the channel. And just as you saw from the Raisin and Avery method, we record nice electropharyngeogram. Ooh, I'm not sure I defined electropharyngeogram. So just as electrocardiograms, sorry, let me just back up here. Right, electrocardiogram, electropharyngeogram, so, um, or EPG. Right, so I'll be saying EPG. Um, and I forgot to define it. OK, so uh, here is an example of a recording, EPG recordings from eight worms in um, one of our chips. And because we want to detect inhibitory effects of antiomentic drugs or candidate drugs, we want the worms to be pumping robustly in the control situation. So to do this, we include serotonin, 5-hydroxytryptamine, in the perfusate, which is long known to be the neuromodular, neuromodulator that um, stimulates pumping. So all our experiments I'll show you have serotonin. In C. elegans experiments have serotonin to drive pumping. The next slide just shows an example of an experiment. Um, the traces are compressed in time. So this is five minutes. These are recordings, EPG recordings from seven different worms, each in a different color. And you can see during the control period, they're pumping away all of them as indicated by the thick line. Then at this bar, we switch the perfusate to 10 micromolar ivermectin, um, which I mentioned before is one of the classic antiomentic drugs. And you see that relatively rapidly, the activity uh, tapers off and then stops. And then the pumping has ceased and the recordings are flatlined. So this is a uh, you know, bioassay for antiomentic activity. And um, in fact, ivermectin in, in its use in uh, treating animals or humans, uh, it, stopping pumping or feeding is one of the important mechanisms by which the worms are killed. They stop feeding, they're paralyzed, and then they're expelled. OK, so we did a lot with C. elegans. Um, this is just one recent paper where we uh, made EPG recordings and then tested 
the responses of C. elegans to um, several classes of antiomintic drug, and we compared the responses of uh, resistant C. elegans strains and susceptible C. elegans strains. So wild-type C. elegans and then mutant strains where uh, mutations have been introduced into ion channels to make the worms resistant or less susceptible to these drugs. So we've done various things with C. elegans, but, um, oops, oh, I did it. I made that thing pop up. It'll go away in a minute. Um, okay, why is my slide not advancing? Sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. That'll go away in a minute. So see it, but so we can do these things with C. elegans, but it's not a parasite. And there's actually quite a bit of controversy in the field about how much the physiology of C. elegans actually relates to that of parasites. So C. elegans is good for some things, but I was interested in whether we could modify our EPG platform to use it with the worms that we actually want to kill. So um, the answer is yes, and um, I'm eternally grateful to the Gates Foundation for funding this work, to take a platform developed for C. elegans and then allowing us to re-engineer it to work with some of the worms that we actually want to kill. Okay, so implementation in parasitic nematodes. So for this work, I focused on soil transmitted helminths, and these are intestinal parasites. So there's three categories, hookworm, uh, roundworms, whipworms. They're all transmitted by skin contact from fecally contaminated soil. So say in communities where people don't have um, toilets and sanitation of that sort. And there's over a billion people infected worldwide. And typically, people are infected with all three species. And it these infections take a horrific toll. So especially in children, a uh, typical worm burden in um, a, a child will steal 25% of a child's nutrition every day. And the result is physical and cognitive stunting and then uh, and chronic anemia because the worms are blood feeders. And so children start off with a bad start and then these infections in older children and adults cause morbidity illness um, throughout their whole lives so there's a big toll of these infections so um some of the work we did was on uh ankylostoma salonicum which is um a hookworm that's easy to rear in the lab. And these experiments were done at George Washington University with my colleague, John Hodden. We took our equipment to his lab where he rears these animals actually in hamsters. And this is just a picture. We had to change the dimensions of the EPG chip to work for different species. So here's a hookworm. Here's the worm trap. This worm is tail first. When, when, we, when we load them into chips, they randomly end up head first or tail first. And all that does is reverse the polarity of the electropharyngiogram. So it doesn't matter which way they're in, we, we can deal with it. And you can see the big mouth of the hookworm here compared to um, C. elegans. And here's a recording of pharyngeal pumping in this hookworm. So we did a series of experiments. Here's just one example. So these are hookworm L4s. The hookworms infect mammals in the L3 stage. They then um, undergo development to a parasitic L4 and then go on to adulthood later. Anyway, these are worms removed from hamsters um, during their, ho their host stage larvae. And, and this just should look very similar or familiar to you where again, we're doing control recordings from seven worms in one chip. Then we switch to ivermectin and the activity stops. And we can quantify this and do dose response curves and um, the things you might expect. And um, 
so I won't go into all these details, but suffice it to say, we um, made this work with hookworm. And we've also been uh, working with other parasitic species of interest of both humans and animals. And the trick with this, you have to modify the chip and then you have to decide how to make the worms happy. You know, what is it that they want in order to be pumping in a sustained and robust manner? And in C. elegans, we use serotonin. It turns out in the parasites, um, some like serotonin, some don't like serotonin. Um, they tend to like blood serum, which is, you know, they feed on blood. So we have to, in each case, have to figure out what they want to have in the culture medium to make them, quote unquote, happy to be pumping away so we can test for inhibition by antihelmintic drugs and candidates. So here's a summary of where we are now. So hookworm, I showed you some data. The, the key here is that we've optimized the protocol. Plus minus means we need further optimization and question mark means we've designed the chips, but we haven't um, optimized the protocol yet, largely because we need funding. Um, I haven't been writing grants to do this lately. Um, I need to get back to doing that. So anyway, things work great in hookworm. Ascarosuum is often argued to be the same species as Ascaros lumbricoides, the human uh, large roundworm. We've also worked with canine heartworm, um, getting good results with that. Homuncus contortus, remember that was the species, the worm that infects sheep and goats. And there's a huge problem with drug resistance. We're underway with that, along with Adrian Wolstenholm at University of Georgia. And the Dara filaria imidis is the canine heartworm parasite. Um, which we desperately need new drugs for, and that um, we've got chips for them, but we haven't uh, tried to optimize the conditions for drug testing yet. But um, Corrine mentioned uh, Nemometrics. I'll say a little bit more about that later. We founded Nemometrics to commercialize this technology and make it available to researchers. Um, and uh, Nema, various Nemometrics customers are using this platform to um, get it to work with different nematode species and stages. So it's not all up to me anymore. So I have other collaborators and we have customers um, working with different parasites too, which is great because there's way too many parasites and uh, too many parasites, not enough time. Okay. So to summarize that, we successfully implemented this platform in uh, parasitic nematodes of humans and animals, um, and that works ongoing. So the last thing I want to mention um, is some work that we've also done ourselves to in the, the search for new antihelmintic drugs. All right. This is a recent paper, um, sertraline, paroxetine, and chlorpromazine are rapidly acting antihelmintic drugs capable of clinical repurposing. And this is work uh, spearheaded by Nikki Liachko, who's a professor at the University of Washington. So repurposing, um, that's a really important concept. So one approach to finding new drugs is to take already approved drugs, which in the US would be FDA approved drugs that are on the market and test them as, as a potential antihelmintics. So what we did was um, okay, right. We screened. Uh, sorry about that. We uh, okay. We screened uh, the NIH clinical collection. So this is 281 uh, drugs that are in clinical use. And we tested them as possible antihelmintics. We found a number of hits. But interestingly, the top three were these human psychiatric drugs. So you may know sertraline and paroxetine are antidepressants like Prozac, same class. They target serotonin transporters. And chlorpromazine is an antipsychotic drug that targets dopamine receptors. And we first validated them in C. elegans and then collaborating with other labs. So the Hodden lab, we also showed the drugs had antihelmintic activity in canine hookworm. 
also in whipworm, trichuris, and then in a, not, in a trematode, not a nematode, but the trematode schistosoma mansoni, which is what causes um, schistosomiasis or bilharzia or snail fever. So these three drugs had a broad spectrum of activity across different parasites. Now, the, we were really curious, well, what are the drugs acting on to kill these worms? And one great thing about um, C. elegans, as I mentioned, is you can do genetic manipulations. So we did a mutant analysis and uh, uh, knocked out or mutated the expected targets of these three drugs. So the serotonin transporter, dopamine receptors, and the drugs were still effective in killing worms. So they don't, these drugs are not acting on canonical targets. And we'd love to know uh, what they act on. Um, we don't know yet. And another important thing we need to do is in vivo testing to see, you know, can, how, at what doses and treatments do these drugs clear worms from an animal model? So that still needs to be done. But this just illustrates that, you know, there, it's so expensive and takes such a long time to put new drugs through clinical trials. This idea of repurposing existing drugs shows great promise. Another approach is to take advantage of traditional medicine. And I know this is so such a rich area in Africa, and there's so many neuroscientists uh, using this approach, which is to take you know, ethnobotanical products, so plants that are used medicinally by traditional healers and, and uh, you know, are used, say, to rid people of worms in this case and test them as possible sources of new drugs. So in this case, the Hodden Lab at George Washington University uh, took uh, 12 plant, um, plants that are used traditionally in Haiti for worming. And typically you take the leaves of the plant and make it into a tea and drink it and to um, treat worms. And oops, this is a little covered up here, but um, in a paper in 2008, they found that this plant, Mamortica carantia, carantia or bitter melon was the most efficacious in killing hookworms of the 12 that were tested. So we decided to use EPG recordings to further explore this antiomintic effect. And interestingly, one thing we found is that the worms have to be feeding, have to be a feeding stage worm for uh, aqueous extracts of this plant to kill them. So um, we found that worms treated with this, uh, with the aqueous extract of Mamortica, um, stop feeding and then die. But an interesting thing was that they have to ingest it first. For a lot of drugs, there's controversy over whether an antimentic drug acts by going through the cuticle, does it go through the body wall, or does it need to be ingested by the worm or both? So here's our working model of how this traditional um, plant extract works. So he, here we have a parasitic worm. What we found is when it first exposed to the extract, it stimulates feeding. So what we see is, you know, the worms are pumping away, ingesting, uh, just ba at baseline activity. Then when they are, when they are perfused with this um, extract, they pump like mad. They just you know, ingest the pumping, the feeding rate goes way up, but then some number of hours later, it kills them. So they ingest a lot and then they get sick and die. And of course, this is a crude plant extract. There's many, many compounds in there. So uh, the next questions, which the Hodden lab is addressing is what are the nematicidal compounds in this plant extract and how do they kill worms? So this is an example of using traditional medicine to seek potential new antimentic drugs. And finally, um, I have a collaboration with Bayer that's been very fruitful, um, looking at uh, development of new antimentic drugs for humans uh, and animals. Um, they're interested in canine heartworm and also 
uh, river blindness. So I'm working with them um, on a project. So, and we have other industry partners at NEMA Metrics. Um, this work is being done at. Okay, to conclude, let's see how much time I have left. Oh, perfect. Okay, here's some conclusions. So, um, as Corinne mentioned, I've been, you know, teaching in Africa for a long time, since 1996. I also am a, a student and performer of Zimbabwean music and have spent a lot of time in Zimbabwe studying with my teachers. And so through my teaching and also living in rural areas, um, this is what motivated me to, to reorient my research in my, at my University of Oregon lab from what I was doing before, which was insect um, neuroscience, electrophysiology, looking at hormone effects on neural circuits and pharmacology, synaptic transmission. And so over the last 10 years or so, I shifted my focus to working on nematodes and on nem nematodes that are relevant to neglected tropical diseases. So our basic research in my lab and Sean Lockery's lab we use C. elegans, electrophysiological methods, and microfluidics to develop this new platform that was useful for antimentics research. And then, as I described, we then were able to transform this platform for use with parasites. Let me just mention another approach that's been fruitful is if you're interested in a gene target in parasites, you can swap the parasitic gene into C. elegans. So say you're interested in the glutamate gated chloride channel of say a hookworm, you can use CRISPR to knock out um, the C. elegans version and pop in the parasite version of that gene. We also, um, it, it's being used, so this platform is being used in academia and also in industry to look for new antimentic candidates. Also, something I didn't talk about, we use the EPG platform to study human genetic diseases. So we have a big project where we're using human, putting human gene variants in ion channels into C. elegans and then recording EPGs to find phenotypes and then testing which drugs may uh, ameliorate the channelopathy. And again, uh, we took this work from, a, from the lab and formed a company and commercialized it. And now um, ma are making these techniques available around the world. Let me just acknowledge uh, funding funders, Gates, Found whoops, Gates Foundation I mentioned, National Center for Veterinary Parasitology, uh, National Institutes of Health, and let me just end by thank you for to thank you for attending, and again thanks for Sona for hosting this webinar series, and I am finished. Well, thank you both, Yanis, uh, for this impressive presentation. Um, really interesting how you showed some flexibility moving from your traditional research to something that was relevant uh, to what you found in the field in Africa. And uh, I think this is also an interesting so story for, for us young researchers who are like trying to think out of the box really and try to be uh, like finding innovative uh, uh, answers to traditional questions. Uh, I'm getting a comment here uh, from Christopher Mozambi a uh, drug repurposing has great prospect and he's experiment, experimenting on the anti effect of some antidepressant in reptile. Okay, hmm. so that was that was one comment. Uh, somebody, okay, another comment coming up here. Um, I might read and uh, I will I really suggest, suggest that people ask questions. I learned that some viral infection are NTDs, the cheap and the initiative behind its creation are very impressive. And that was uh, getting into my next comment. Okay, <laughs> from Professor Amadi here, great interaction with Africa and Sona led to this new direction of neuroscience research. Absolutely, it changed my life. Yeah. Whoops. So, um, 
uh, this uh, chip that you have developed uh, is the fruit of a, well, it's actually high-end technology type of chip. And I'm, I'm sure what is running in the mind of most of our followers today is how they could get such a tool and how this type of tool could be used in a very limited resources environment in Africa, where, as you already mentioned, and you saw it uh, during your stay in Africa, people are using those plants and drop extract, and it would be really awesome if they could actually be able to test their product on site instead of looking for external corroboration, which is not always easy to, to manage. So would you comment on that? Yeah, so I spoke today about the eight channel platform. That's not commercially available, although I have a system uh, at Nema Metrics that I use for collaborations. But what we do have um, is a simple version of the eight channel platform mm -hmm. that is just one channel. Um, it's so it's available. I can't remember the current price right now. But, but, you know, the, this, the problem, I mean, you all know, a problem in Africa is the lat is limited funding. And so this technology, the instrumentation would be less than $20,000. The chip, each chip for the single channel platform is $50. And, um, you know, that adds up quickly. Mm -hmm. Anybody who might be interested in pursuing this direction should contact me directly because I would love I would love to see more nematode research in Africa. And I know say trend in Africa, they've really had great initiatives to introduce people to some of these invertebrate models. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, uh, as far as I'm aware, there's none of this technology being used in Africa, but it's something I would love to see to help promote people's research. Okay, so we have a comment popping up here from Hifi Wifi. Most interesting is the story behind MC. MC is highly multipotential. It's been shown that uh, to have anti-diabetics effect, I guess, but they are very toxic to humans. So what's your opinion about this? Well, yeah, no, uh, Memortica, if you look at the list of biological activities that are it's thought to have or been demonstrated to have, it does everything, it seems like. And anti-diabetic activity is one of the best known. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, toxic to humans, people drink the tea, um, doesn't kill them. I've had people come to my presentations and say, oh, my grandmother in India drinks a big cup of bitter melon tea every morning. Um, but the, but one thing we don't know is what concentration is, are the concentrations of the, say the tea brewed from leaves that you'd need to drink to have an antihelmintic effect, is that in the mm -hmm. range that is not toxic? Um, so yeah, that's an excellent question for all plant compounds. Well, there is a following up um, uh, question from the same person. Uh, what are your speculation if these repurposed drugs are not acting on the worm but via conventional pathways? So I guess the question is we have like, you showed a suggestion of mechanism, for example, for this last uh, uh, tea extract that you showed where the worm actually start feeding up and feeding up and only after that stage, they will get killed. So this is just one potential mechanism, I guess. Yeah, so for those psychiatric drugs, we were shocked. I mean, we were, we were still shocked. And we tested over and over and over with all kinds of knockout mutants and uh, loss of function mutants and all that, because we just couldn't believe that the drugs were not acting on their expected targets. So the, the question here is, what could I speculate on where they might be acting? I honestly have no mm -hmm. idea. It's just amazing um, and we would need to do we need to do more experiments. It's a great project and Nikki Liachko in her lab um, she's trying to get tenure and she actually works on neurodegenerative diseases so she sat that has sat the antimentic project aside for a bit but I hope to be able to tell you sometime where they're acting because we'd love to know. Well. 
Hello, can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah, great. Well, we have a following up question getting into that. So beside the NTDs from Professor Amadi here, beside the NTDs, do you see other aspects of mental health? right in broad sense in neuroscience because while well, other people might be interested in Alzheimer's diseases parkinson uh stroke or other other uh neurodegenerative diseases for example so in a broad sense do you consider drug report passing yeah no i think again because it's so expensive to develop a drug and bring it to market through clinical trials I'm not an expert on the full range of repurposing work that's happening around the world, but um, my impression is that it's being widely tested for a variety of um, diseases and conditions. So, um, yeah, uh, let's see, other mm -hmm. aspects of mental health. Yeah, you know, people use a lot of drugs, what are called off-label uses already that so drugs that are prescribed for some other use that they're not officially approved for so yeah it's a, it's a productive direction yeah okay well we have ina el zayed here um actually we're asking a question which i guess you already respond to uh, people are working in a limited uh, lab resource in Africa, so is it possible? I guess you mentioned that you open to get in contact uh, with people who are interested into, well, maybe using this single channel chip that you just mentioned. And uh, I think what we would do is maybe uh, at the end of this webinar to share uh, the contact or your email mm -hmm. address to allow us to do so so that uh, people who are really interested into uh, digging further into this story can get in touch with you. Yeah, uh, and I didn't mention anyone interested. Um, we Nemometrics aims to provide products at lower cost, uh, you know, like simpler solutions, lower cost. We also sell other devices like motility measurement. So where motility is often used in different assays, we have a device that does that that's less expensive. We also make transgenic worms for people. So mm -hmm. anyone interested in any of those um, products or services, just uh, get in touch and we'll, we'll talk. Mm -hmm. This is great. Well, I'm reading out the comments here. Um, somebody interested into drug working on dopamine transporter, for example. Uh, but one question that is coming to my mind now is that you're a specialist of C elegance, and this is a very elegant and easy to handle model. And uh, a lot of people in Africa are trying to do research with animal model, rodent model, and so on. And what would be, I would say, your advice uh, to those young researchers who might be looking into moving to C elegance as a model of research? instead of using, for example, rodents that are not always uh, easy to handle in their research environment? And what would be the limitations that you could see? Because you've been there and you know how the labs looks like. So what would be your advice there? Mm -hmm. Well, that's partly a political question, I think. Mm -hmm. My impression is that you know, universities, medical schools, funding sources in Africa are very are highly focused on clinical and preclinical like rodent work more so than invertebrate in, invertebrate neuroscience such as fruit flies c elegans mm -hmm. or even zebra fish which are mm -hmm. you know vertebrates it seems like there are some labs moving in that direction and trend africa again um the trend group is uh training people in that area so I would love to see more of it, but it, it seems like it's a direction that people have to navigate carefully to make sure that if they're working in that area, that they have support within their department and, and university. But compared to, compared to rodents, I mean, worms, you just put them on auger and sit them on the bench top in the lab. Mm -hmm. So they're cheap, they're easy to rear, um, there are a lot of advantages price-wise to working on C. elegans, and you can order mutants online, like like going to Amazon.com practically. You just order your mutants. 
so um, it has a lot of pos you know a tremendous potential and I and I hope it makes more inroads over time but again um, it's 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 a new field in yeah you know, it's it's yeah it's well well he I guess uh, Professor Yan has just answered your question to set up a C elegance model what does it take prof so I guess you were actually answering this question already. Yeah, we have a, I think there's a blog post on the Nemometrics site exactly on that topic. Like, because some of the customers we work with have only worked on rodents, like drug companies in the US. They want to do, say, toxicity testing of compounds and they don't want to do rats. They want to start with worms. So we, we actually advise labs that are new to C. elegans. So you can look on the website or email me and I'll send you the link to that information. And we're happy to help. That's great. Well, we don't have any other question here in the live chat. I don't see anything anymore. I see oh. Professor Amadi's comment. Yes, Thank same. You. It's my great pleasure and to mm -hmm. wear my whip Sona shirt here. And <laughs> what a great organization. Yeah, well, it was great hearing this talk today again. And uh, this talk is going to be shared on the YouTube channel so people can browse ahead and see it uh, for those who couldn't attend this live session. It was really a great pleasure having you. Thank you for taking your time on a Saturday early in the morning, right? Because uh, you're in the US now, uh, where to share this with us. And uh, all those little steps are bringing us forward. and. Uh, yeah, we're happy for your long life support. Thank you so much again, yeah. uh, Professor Yanis. And with that, uh, we'll be closing. Yeah, this thanks, session. Karine and Mossab, for setting mm -hmm. this up. And greetings to all of you there out in the yeah. well, YouTube universe. Care. Yeah. Again, if we have any questions coming afterwards, we might turn them to uh, those to you. And we will share also your contact with those who register for this webinar in case you receive any emails from students from Africa. Yeah. Thank you so much again. You bet. Thank you. Thank you.